Nick Peckford is the Vice Chancellor of the, um, the University of Northampton and in his past was a Vulcanologist. And if you want to ask him what that is, you're very welcome. Uh, uh, and then Tim, Tim Curtis is um, a senior lecturer in the health department and he's responsible for the relationship between the university and Ashoka uh, and this whole Change Makers program. So Nick, uh, how long have you been the Vice Chancellor? I've been three years, five months. Years. Right, and, and why on earth did you want to go and run a university in Northampton? I was attracted to the university because of its social mission. Uh, it's, a, it's a predominantly a working class town, Northampton. It attracts um, a, a type of student who will be familiar in other universities across the UK, perhaps London Met, South Bank, urban uh, in some respect, but also uh, local in, in, in getting in people from a, a, a part of the, a Britain that's uh, suffered from a decline in industry, which was shoemaking. Yeah. Uh, and leather industry. So there's that legacy there. The university really is, is often, as education is, the way out for people from um, you know, backgrounds which aren't so privileged. Uh, and it's my privilege, actually, to lead a university which has that social aspect as part of its mission. Right, that's exciting. And, and Tim, what, you, 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 how long have you been up there? You know, uh, about five years. So I, I was working in uh, environmental activism and community activism in Scotland and right. came down to be the university's first social enterprise lecturer at the business school. Right. I came down uh, uh, to, to apply to become you know, a university lecturer in, in social entrepreneurship and my f question to the, the interview panel was why Northampton? Yeah. Uh, why, you know, who's heard, ever heard of Northampton University but also why would Northampton University uh, do this? And then I met people like Chris Durkin and Ray Owen who had already been working uh, in, the f in the field for a very long time. And really what so uh, University of Northampton was doing was social entrepreneurship, just hadn't called it that. Right. Been doing it for a long time, lots of community activism, lots of uh, working with uh, working class students, uh, taking them from very uh, poor backgrounds into uh, graduate uh, status. And if somebody comes on your program, uh, yeah. so the, uh, uh, if somebody comes on the social enterprise program, what do they actually learn? What's, what's the, what's some, just give us the highlights of the curriculum. Well, the key thing is that we actually don't have a degree in social enterprise anymore. Uh, the right. whole university does social entrepreneurship, oh. and that's one of the key things. I, I devised a uh, wonderfully right. De uh, beautifully designed uh, undergraduate degree and postgraduate degree in social enterprise but didn't recruit because who thinks of social entrepreneurship as being a career uh, outcome um, uh, and effectively what we've ma managed to do with Nick's guidance is to turn the whole university into something that promotes social entrepreneurship so the key thing about that is no matter what degree program you come and you think you want to do as a career you become a specialist in nursing for example is alongside that you then learn how to solve problems so you're an expert nurse, you're, you're an outstanding nurse because you've gone through a process of uh, understanding social problems and solving problems. Our response to um, uh, Avalanche, and in fact I think we were doing it before Avalanche, and very helpful for us to put what we were doing into context, um, is that we want to embed this stuff across the organisation. That's why Changemaker, and we're calling it Changemaker Plus, because we want a UK version of what the American Changemaker is, is about. And we're just discovering and finding out for ourselves in this year what that will mean for us. Um, is that it is embedded. It's not run out of a central research department, there's not a school for social entrepreneurship, it's everywhere. And the kind of phrase that we use to describe that is this notion of a T-shaped student, right, T-shaped. If you think of the letter T, uh, you can interpret it various ways, but the bar across the top, that could be your three years uh, in mechanical engineering or in midwifery or, you know, politics. The stalk of the T, that's the value added bit, that's where we embed the whole change maker, the social entrepreneurship, the employability, the volunteering. So the package, the T-shaped student, when they leave the university is, is kind of geared up to whatever subject they've done to help solve problems. Um, and that's right. really at the heart of what we're doing. So, so in Pearson, as you probably know, and certainly the Pearson people in the audience know, <coughs> we're, um, we've got this big focus on efficacy, which um, is absolutely at the core of the new strategy that Pearson is mapping out and, and what we mean by efficacy is that when we um, develop a product we will be able to um, first of all say it, this product is intended to achieve these learner outcomes um, and this is how we're going to measure it and then we're going to track and see whether it measures and we want to be judged on our impact on learner outcomes as yeah. much as we do on our yeah. um, financial uh, returns and all of that. How would you know, I mean, how will you know under this new strategy when a student leaves the University of Northampton that they are a change maker or a social entrepreneur or, mm. or whatever? What, what's what's going to be the, the measure that will tell us that you've succeeded with this? 
Well, if you look at that, there is, I mean, Tim will have a, we were talking about this on the train come up, actually, it's an obvious question. One of the areas that we, one of the, a crude metric is that we, we have three levels, if you like, of how a student can engage with social enterprise, social entrepreneurship at the university presently. Um, that's it. Uh, we will place you as a work placement in a social enterprise that's in the community. We'll place you in one that we own, because partly what we're doing is actually buying shares or buying up social enterprises that we can then use as avenues to place students in a right. more effective way, because we own part of the company. Why, why not? Right. Um, and then, but most importantly, is in the entrepreneurship bit, getting students to set their own social enterprises up. And we know that most will fail. And what's wrong with that? You know, right, because the whole right. point about learning, right. you know, the, the, the rather cheesy thing, but it's true. I've learned most of the things in my life through things I've got wrong. You know, yeah. but at university, of course, you, all you have to do, you, you, you're there to pass stuff. The idea of failure fills you with dread. So how do you, the contradiction between being a university being entrepreneurial and allowing you know, the creative juices to flow? Oh, but if you fail your entrepreneurial exam, you're out. I mean, it's it's, it's a nonsense, isn't it? So how, how do you pull those two together? So. Helping students to set their own companies up is a key thing. And so one metric, back to your question, of success would be how many students have set their own social enterprises up across university in the last two or three years um, as one metric, how many have succeeded, right. etc. So we can start right. to weave in these sorts of ideas around getting traction in the... Uh, in and the, the fourth process. level is more, more difficult than the social impact of a university like ourselves. It's starting businesses, having graduate students, and uh, but the most important thing is the decisions those graduates make over their careers. Um, and that's much more, much less tangible. Uh, but some might start social enterprises, but what, 10% of the population actually start businesses in their career? But 90% of them still can make significant changes <coughs> to the organisations that they're a part of. So employability for us is not just about getting your first job, but it's about being employable and being a change maker throughout and, that career. And, and have you got employability sort of built into the... Pro how, how, does it, how does employability feature in this? Yeah, it's more than just you know being a, a, a creating a good CV, but it's about going and demonstrating to people that you've made changes, you're doing this, or you're uh, you have uh, that you've you've had the experience of making changes. You've worked with a social enterprise, uh, or a charity, or a community group, and you've improved them. Um, so part of our change maker certificate, which is something that every all of our fourteen thousand students get to st uh, study alongside their degree, is they choose their their, their social interest, they choose their social organisation, or the thing that they would like to change, and throughout their three years they get to explore and experiment uh, right. how to change and come out with a kind of a, a, a personal business plan as so it they have to do that as part of it to get they have to do it no they have the opportunity to do it uh, right. uh, and increasingly that then becomes part of what your degree program is right so so la last question um, the the town so how, how, how's it how, is, how are you catalyzing something that is going to change Northampton is that consciously part of the agenda have you got good relations? You must yeah. be in touch with the health service all the time. Well, perversely, I wish I'm doing a lot of work with the police force at the moment, right. rather than the, the health sector. My, my background is in community development, okay. um, uh, and you know, if, if anyone said to you, "Can a, a, a police and community support op officer be entrepreneurial?" Yes, because I've, well, I've been working with North Ants Police. Uh, is how we actually work with community groups, how PCSOs work with community right. groups to cre create sustainable, self-sustaining uh, 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 community programs that in improve safety. That sounds very interesting. Oh, well, you know, so PCSOs being major change agents within the police force, that's a massive mindset change for the police force, for them yeah. to say, actually, your change agents are not your senior officers, they're the people on the street who are wearing a blue uniform. Um, such th that over the next five years now I'm going to be working with North Ants Police to actually change them, their operating model on the change maker principles. Right. So they're going to be looking you know, to be effectively becoming a change maker police force on right. the basis that entrepreneurs, an entrepreneurial approach to okay. policing. And, and Nick, how, 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 the university must be in dialogue with the, yeah. the city. So, so two brief ones on that. One is, one is it picks up on something Tim was talking about with the police. <laughs> There's these, um, because the change at the NHS, health and wellbeing board has been set up across the UK in order to, to, to coordinate and integrate better healthcare with education. Because uh, at the moment you think it's quite it's quite siloed out there. You know, you, uh, housing is often not seen as, as part of the healthcare agenda or social welfare agenda. But of course, it's a massive issue. So, so we are. Um, I'm the, in fact the vice chair of Northamptonshire Health and Wellbeing Board, and we've set up an institute for health and wellbeing in university, which will mirror uh, and start to do research and, and guide. Uh, the county, uh, and it's a model that if it works properly could be transported to other parts of the UK, in how you integrate services better across from, from, from re-offending all the way through to, to, to early years uh, in, in primary schools. That will happen. More importantly, more excitingly for us in terms of the regeneration of Northampton is that it actually has the biggest enterprise zone in, in England. 
Uh, it's six miles of waterfront along the Northampton Enterprise, uh, Northampton uh, River Nen. Um, and we want to relocate the entire university on two campuses into the Enterprise Zone uh, and have a brand new 21st century university built by 2018. It's a massive £330 million project. Um, it will bring vast amounts of jobs, regenerative power to, 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 to the town of Northampton. It's a big scheme. It's, it's been backed by UK's Treasury, so it's up there with uh, high-speed uh, Hinkley Power Station, <laughs> <laughs> HS2, I bet not <laughs> Some of the other big, big infrastructure projects are part of the UK to get Britain building again. And so we've, I mean, I, I can't think of a better way to perhaps to end this conversation than the University of Northampton. Absolutely the forefront of a massive, you know, countrywide regeneration project with the university at the core. That's very exciting. So, questions? Uh, yes. For those students who have gone on to set up a social enterprise, do you have any feedback from them as to what's been kind of an enabling factor? So has it been the relationship with their lecturer? Has it been the strength of the university's network with entrepreneurs? And then for those kind of social entrepreneurs, do you know what they become? Have they, so say if their social enterprises fail, do they then go on to work for an employer or do they become kind of serial entrepreneurs? So you might have two yeah. quick examples. One is, um, and they're perhaps unexpected, one of the one of the, 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 the best, so, when I say best, the most sort of uh, exciting social enterprises I think we've had in, in the last 12, 14 months is, is, a, is a drama group. Uh, they did drama at university, three years. They set up a comp drama company called Tap the Table, a social enterprise. And they go around to, to, to performances in schools, um, talking about social value, social inclusion. That is becoming a very successful drama troupe as a social enterprise. Okay, that's one good example. Another one is a group of students from computing who set up a recy computer recycling um, uh, uh, social enterprise. You really go down to the tip. You see them all piled up, don't you? Monitors and all the rest of it, and printers and you know, old Amstrad things, and all that. A lot of that stuff ends up in rubbish tips in Nigeria, like huge piles of junk. Um, <coughs> people live out in Nigeria on the tips, and they mine them with their families because there's a whole bunch of precious metals uh, inside. So, and mobile phones as well. Now, you're not going to stop them doing that, but what this group of individuals did was, was set up a company called We, Recy we Re PC, Recycling uh, Computer um, uh, Social Enterprise, going out and working with the people in Nigeria to improve health and safety. <coughs> okay, so that, uh, quite interesting, two very diverse, yeah. um, uh, and why did they do that? They did that because I think they were inspired, not by the likes of me, but certainly by the likes of Tim, and the, the lecturers, that were um, uh, keen to push forward the idea of social enterprise and entrepreneurship in general. It ch changes their expectation of what their career is and their first job. So uh, one uh, student who's graduating this year um, always wanted to be a social worker and that's what she's de dead set to, uh, set to become a social worker. In, in her volunteering <coughs> module uh, in the first year, um, uh, in the middle of the module, her mum uh, lost her baby just after birth. Uh, and that seriously affected the family, but also she found that they couldn't afford a headstone for the uh, uh, for the baby because they hadn't planned. Uh, when you're having a baby, you don't plan for a funeral. Um, and she found that there were quite a number of other uh, uh, people like that. So she, in her first year, she started a charity uh, raising money for headstones for children. And she thought, oh, that's interesting. I'll do it with my mum for a while, and we'll get some kind of people from the TV to come along and uh, and raise money and stuff like that. Um, and now she's saying, actually, I don't want to be a social worker. I want to go national with this charity. So it's, you know, it's, it's changing the nature of what the student thinks uh, that they want to, to, to A lot of students will come to university with a very clear understanding of what they think they want to do as a career. And then the social entrepreneurship allows them to think about alternative ways, creating their career rather than yeah. graduating with a CV and going, where can I get a job from? Yeah. My name's Diana Foster. I'm involved in digital design of higher educational materials and I was interested from your perspective working with lecturers of the challenges of the changing role. Obviously from when I went to college, lecturers were lecturers <laughs> and um, it does pose new challenges to lecturers in having more material and they're not expected to lecture but they're expected to add value in other ways. How do you support them or how yeah. do your staff find that? I think that's a super question. And, you know, look, what are we doing now? We, we're, um, this is a, what's, it's a broadcast, isn't it? By and large, we're kind of broadcasting at you. You're sat there listening, getting bored or fidgeting, whatever you're doing. That hasn't changed for centuries, has it? You know, the way that we do education to people. So I think there's a super, if, if you're a forward-thinking individual, there's a super opportunity to make the education experience <coughs> more enhanced through technology. And that should not be seen as a threat. That should be seen as an opportunity. But again, it's kind of how you how you package it, how you sell it, and how you work with academics 
in order to come to a shared understanding of what that new student experience has to be. Uh, it's all about that honest conversation. You know, uh, and it's about not being confrontational with it. It's about accepting where we are, but then rapidly <coughs> moving to a, a different solution. I think that, to me, is exciting. If I was an academic, I'd be, well, I'm an academic, what am I saying? <laughs> <laughs> we'll edit that one I out. Am, later. <laughs> I am really excited about the prospects of, of changing the way that students and young people learn. The thing is not to ask us, but we're older. You know, go to a school now, 12, 13, 14-year-olds, and ask them, what they want in three or four or five years time. But have you got a, a I thought implied in the question was some kind of, was whether you've got a strategy for, uh, I call it staff development strategy, where lecturers are being, first of all, being informed about what the new, or sort of learn, becoming aware of what yeah. the new role will look like and secondly, learning the skills. Because a lot of them won't necessarily yeah, yeah, have yeah, these we, skills. We, we, I mean, we, yeah, so this, this was, w the way that one of the best ways we communicate with staff is not through emails, actually. It's the one thing that staff members in my experience will actually look at is something attached to their pay slip. <laughs> so we, <laughs> for very self interested reasons. Yeah. So, so we use the pay slip. So, so a lot of our comms are, so this is something we, we should put out just before Christmas Change Maker Plus. We're creating a new kind of university. We need your help. Um, you know, we're, we're at a place now in this journey in the next year where we're going to have a whole series of <coughs> consultations around what Michael has said about how do we get staff involved. We have um, a teaching and learning champions in each of the schools. We're looking at different kinds of, 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 of uh, te te technology driven education through a, f f f a, 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 a big MOOC at one end. We're not going to go down the MOOC. We've got a SOOC, right, which is a small open online content. So we use a SOOC in our university for students who've come in through clearing perhaps whose A-level points aren't as good as perhaps they, they, they would have been, who are at risk, we know they're at risk, of, of leaving university. Um, we use our targeted SOOC for that particular segment of the university. It's, it's, it's working quite well at the moment. But, Nick, sorry, to, to, you know, to be frank, we don't have a digital strategy because to create a digital strategy now would be to presume that we know what the answer is. As, as you know, I'm not a senior, uh, senior manager, but uh, for Nick to presume he knows what the answer is, the consultation process that we're engaging with is to create the strategy that comes out of that. So how, how, is you, how will you as an academic uh, uh, deal with these digital uh, challenges? To so setting out the vision, setting out what, uh, what is likely to happen in the future and saying how are we going to build towards that? And a, a university is uh, open enough to be able to create different solutions for different parts. So the solution in nursing is going to be very different from the sort of solution you get in uh, arts or drama or something like that. Um, the, you know, the, the being able to deliver uh, online material uh, in accounting <coughs> might be quite straightforward. You know, uh, thermodynamics doesn't change. Mm -hmm. But uh, social issues in, in social work uh, is something that does change year in and year out and does require a face-to-face -face, uh, strategy. Yeah. Uh, so it's That's about creating important. strategy out of what we're already doing really well rather than saying, oh, you, you're rubbish at digital strategy or you don't have a digital strategy and therefore you must have one. It's building that strategy out towards the future. Can I just say, just follow up, that, Tim's absolutely right. And I think the danger of this, 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 this probably one of the most overused words in English language, strategy. You know, everyone has to have a strategy. You, you, why? You know, you, you, why do you need all these strategies? Because most of them are never read and don't do anything anyway. They're just documents that just live in the heads of two or three people who wrote the bloody things. So, so the point about um, empowering individuals right, uh, around a far more open-ended plan or, or piece of tactics which might be a year long, because look, who had heard of Twitter five years ago? So if, you're, if, you, and if you wrote a digital strategy then, you'd have missed out a whole bunch of potential innovations if you stuck true to that strategy, yeah? because you'd have been in a cage. The strategy would have put you in a box. So I'm absolutely not going to have a digital strategy in the University of Northampton. Thank you very much for the inspiration and the insight into the future, uh, and thanks for the time that you've given us. Can we give them a round of applause, please? <laughs>